great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. Then all will see how great, how great is our God. The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty. Let all the earth rejoice, let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light. Darkness tries to hide and trembles at his voice and trembles at his voice. How great is our God! Sing with me, how great is our God! And all will see how great, how great is our God. The whole earth is full. Of his glory filled with his glory. The whole earth is filled with his glory. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Holy is the Lord. Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. Holy, holy, holy are you, Just a sound check, hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Give us sound checks, Lord. <laughs> you can say when we can start, Steve, or if, if people tend to like to. Oh really? Yeah. Well, that's just okay. Now we'll now we'll really get started. <laughs> Steve, are you ready and record? Are we? We I have. Okay. Well, let's go for it. Lord, we just welcome you here. You're obviously already here and making your wonderful self at home among us. We just recognize your centrality. We exalt you, Lord. We exalt your glory over our own self-importance, Lord. We exalt your power over our self-effort. We exalt your righteousness over our self-righteousness. We exalt your word over our mental meanderings and rigid opinionation and this world's voices, we tune them out. I believe in Jesus, 
I believe he is the Son of God. I believe he died and rose again. I believe he paid for us all. And I believe that he's here now. Standing in our midst with the power to heal now and the grace to forgive. I exalt thee. to the gathering of saints here, a word of wisdom, knowledge. You can speak it, you can sing it, but just take your liberty. Be led by the Spirit. He loves to see the body of Christ in session, moving in matter with a multiple cast. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Acoustics are very friendly in here, so you can just lift your voice, you'll be heard. Mm.
the Lord is saying that he's in you. You can trust him to live. Don't try to be perfect. Step out and he will intersect your voice and your words. And he'll cause the deposit of your spirit to come forth. We're not here to impersonate perfection, but to be perfected in the art of the heart of relying on him alone who is pure, powerful, and perfect. And our imperfections will be in the blend and the mix, but as we're functioning in love and obedience to the Holy Spirit, they're detoxed. Is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. How great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. The splendor of a king Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice Let all the earth rejoice He wraps himself in light He wraps himself in light The darkness tries to hide And trembles at his voice And trembles at his voice how great is our God, sing with me how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. How great is our God, sing with me how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. I could sing of your love forever. 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 Over the mountains and the sea, your river flows with love for me. And I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth. And I will daily lift my hands. And I will always sing up when your love came down. I could sing of your love forever. 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 Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you. Sing 
of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. Once again, if you got a word of ex exhortation, or encouragement, prophetic edification that builds up, exhortation that stirs up, consolation that soothes, you just feel perfectly free and at home to bring that. Ah, yes.
saves my soul, my Savior God to be. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then saves my soul, my Savior God to be. How great Thou art. to you. Just feel wonderfully at home in our midst. This is your family, your household. Mm. Thank you for the blood of Jesus through which we enter boldly, confidently in your you. presence, Father, knowing that we have forgiveness of sins. We've been declared righteous judicially, and as we embrace that fact, it becomes a force in our lives. We can reject condemnation, Father. Ah, we sin and there's contamination, but you're quick to wash our feet as we just are quick to repent, Lord, and be renewed. The blood of Jesus declares us to be in right standing. You've red stepped our mega sin debt has paid in full. We thank you for that. Thank you, Lord. The blood of Jesus says covenant life has been activated. Inheritance, Father. You mentor us on how to walk and move in that moment by moment. When we drift off into license on the left and legalism on the right, if we're listening, you're quick to renew us. This is the way of the Lord walking in it, just in agreement with your spirit, relying on your light. Thank you for schooling us, Lord, in these things. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. You know, I felt this morning, folks, to move in a storytelling mode. God's restoring the arts to the church, and an art form is storytelling, and that might be the oldest art form of all. Jesus was the master storyteller and parabolizer. And the Lord, when he renews our mind, he underscores and releases our reasoning to track with his word. He releases our recall to be condemnation free in our rearview mirror and to remember just the good times and even the life lessons we learned in difficult times. But he also sanctifies our, our imagination. That's part of our mind. And we dare not keep that locked up. It becomes moldy, dead, we lack vision and it can even become X-rated. The porn princes know that. But God embraces the grace of renewal, including our imagination, our ability to visualize, and it becomes a stage that he invades with spiritual realities. Parabolizing takes natural situations and people and orchestrates them in such a way is to convey invisible truths to the natural. And the eyes of our spirit would see that the spiritual realm is far more real than what we're sitting or standing on. And the next thing you know, it begins to supersede our carnality, overrule it, and we're able to walk in the natural, the supernatural endowment. We begin to get pictures of seeing ourselves provided for, healed, and it's because we're recognizing the love of God calls faith forward. I remember a day when we used to just get a concept of faith and try to conjure it up and it was work. I would confess till my confessor went out and all it would do was underscore symptoms and heightened anxiety. But when we get that revelation of God's goodness and promises at heart level and get out of the mental gymnastics, we perceive God's love and faith comes forward, a dynamic faith. And as there's an embracing at heart level of revelatory truth of God's love and his promises, our declaration has power. Confession that harmonizes with the very heart of God. It has power. 
And we're not just trying to get things. We are desiring a greater closeness with the king, a greater intimacy, the ability to make him known. And on the basis of that, things that we need are added unto us. They overtake and catch up with us. And we'll have things in various degrees, depending on what our calling is. We find him marvelously generous, intervening in points of need. So we're going to kind of move in storytelling. And now allow the Lord to take our sanctified, renewed mind and the imagination to be invaded with revelation of events around the Jordan 2,000 years ago. His voice swelled the dry desert air. And the sun was rising on a new day. And the people had come out to see and hear a fellow named John. He was the butt of jokes of the Pharisees, but you could sense them shaking in their sandals under their well-heeled tables and their topsy highfalutin, top-heavy, pharisaical headgear kind of beginning to shake as they could sense a fresh wind that was going to topple their house of cards of religious control and self-aggrandizement that had perverted the law of God. And they came out to see, to make an appearance, perhaps wanting to get uh, recognition. Let's hear it for Rabbi Mordecai so-and-so and all in his congregation stand up and holler and let's see who's got the most here and do all that. John pretty well ignored them except to address them as generation of vipers. But his voice, and I can imagine his forehead was kind of furrowed and he was looking with this intense gaze of a prophet under bushy eyebrows. And once in a while, I can imagine among the hungry and the hurting, there was the leaven of a heckler there. Maybe he shouted out, Hey, John, is that a grasshopper leg sticking out of a corner of your mouth? You brushed your teeth this morning? Another one. Hey, John, is that a moldy honey flake in your, your beard there? Hmm. John, the sun's starting to rise here, and uh, you get back down in the Jordan and start baptizing people. When it dries out, that coat of yours is probably going to itch. You ever think about that, John? John is fixated. And he's declaring the word. Repent! The kingdom of God is at hand. Turn from self-rule and expect the rule of the Spirit, the Lord. Prepare him place, make way for the God of grace. John continues to minister. Make straight the way of the Lord. And I can hear him saying between the lines, there's a freeway being constructed. Would you like for your heart to be a freeway construction site? The Lord was saying then through John and says today. And John goes on to extrapolate. Every valley will be filled and every mountain made low. And I can see him starting to explain that. And the next thing you know, um, Heckler with several extra portions of testosterone comes running out of the crowd with violence on his mind. But I can imagine John, he puts down his staff and kind of reaches up to stroke his beard and a steely bicep protrudes. And the dude stops dead in his tracks and kind of slinks back off into the crowd. John continues to teach. Every valley will be filled. Those victory voids to where you just can't seem to, to get a grip and a handle on victory and and just vacancies of understanding where you feel dumb as a post, struggles to where you find yourself in the lost column again and again. He says you can take the trap doors of shame that cover those things and allow the very life substance of God's liberating truth to flow into that and bring it up to life. And then he goes on to say, and every mountain will be made low. Those obstructions, those blind spots through religious rigidity, 
Are sacred cows of opinionation some that need to be slaughtered and barbecued? Blockages that refuse to give the spirit license and leeway? He says, those are made low. And he says, it helps if you stand and agree with me and command them to move. But if you don't, I'll level them anyway. <laughs> so you can see, and then very often the valleys continue to be filled, the overflowing. And about that time, the mass of humanity clustered along the banks of the Jordan parts, and there's a corridor. And this kingly figure begins to stride forward from the masses. He moves with confidence, and John sees him. John turns around and heads down into the Jordan and assumes a position about belly button deep there. And as you can see, Jesus moving forward, coming from the right sky as kind of an embodiment of light that has the movements of a winged dove and it's starting to zero in on its royal target. And in the distance there is the faint and growing sound, crescendo of rumbling thunder. It's going to become verbal and say, this is my beloved son. It's all coming together in marvelously maestro sleep. Don't you love it when a plan comes together? You know, if John would have had a theme song, I think it would have sounded something like this. I'm a voice in the wilderness. I know that I look strange. My clothes are funny. My food is kind of weird. While you're blinking with jaws of gay I don't care what you see. I'm a whole lot more concerned with what you hear. Just make straight the way of the Lord. The mountains will be level, the valleys filled. Behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. The kingdom's coming, it's the Master's will. He turned to the scribes and the Pharisees and he said, You religious high hats make way. For the ones made low that know they're weak and wicked and need to turn. But you generation of vipers, go back to the end of the line. Hey, you've been teaching things you need to learn. Now the stain of sin has dyed your hearts, the color of your face. Now before the thunder of his lips. And he'll purge you with the Holy Spirit, purge you with his fire, and he'll free your soul from Satan's crime. Just make straight the way of the Lord. The mountains will be level, the valleys filled. Behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. Hey, the kingdom's coming, it's the Master's will. I must decrease, he must increase, that's all right with me. And with you, it's got to be the same. Yet it fills my heart with holy joy. He's made us a sign to point folks to the wonder of his name. Just make straight the way of the Mountains will be level, the valley spills. Behold the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. Kingdom's coming, it's the Master's will. Kingdom's coming, it's the Master's will. Now a personal word or two. A primary function of the prophetic is edification. That underscores your new creaturehood. Who you are in the Lord and who you're becoming in expression. Something of who you are in Christ, perhaps an underscoring of your giftings, a 
and the stoking of that inner fire, which is exhortation, encouragement that inspires. When God stokes our inner fire, not to stoke it, leave a bruise, but cause the fire to rise and reveal the face of Jesus, something of our path in Him. And then there's conflict. That's just the soothing love strokes, the embrace of His grace, the massage of the balm of Gilead in areas of woundedness, fatigue of heart and soul. And think it not absurd that a prophetic word can be sung. For the sons of Asaph, they prophesied on harps. So I guess I can do it on a guitar. Speaks of worshiping with a ten stringed instrument, and so I should be able to add two and do it with a twelve. I'll ask a name, further personalize it, and technology's afforded that it's being recorded. So you can listen to it repeatedly. Test it, lay it alongside the written statement of Scripture. Let the Spirit bear witness, and I submit it to pastoral authority here. What is your name? Benjamin. Benjamin. Benjamin, your soul chemistry is kind of a blend of gentleness and intensity. There's an intense desire to draw closer to the Lord because you've seen what he can do in your life already. There is tremendous liberation and inner healing from a collapsed relationship in the past, but the Lord was there amid the rubble and trouble and say, Ben, I love you, as is with the ability to transform you. And transformation begins, and those around you begin to see. of Brother Benjamin coming forward. There's more blessing where that came from. Where the enemy has tried to play blame games from past failures. The Lord shatters that distorted rearview mirror and replaces it with perspective on how he was there all along, bringing it forward and restoring your song of joy as only he can. You're a good man, man with a love for the Lord. Feel a song coming on here. What is your name? Sandra. What again? Sandra. Sandra. Now the Lord, he was there in the dark night of your soul. He was there, your heart to touch and your hand to hold. He cut your face into his hands, lifted you up and said, Hey Sandra, I'm the glory and the lifter of your head. been your faithfulness, bold has been your confession of my truth. I drive away depression and renew the strength of your youth. With a freshness of hope, good times yet to come, expectancy of good things from a good God as you're looking to him, and surely you are, he's brought you this far. Jesus is here, and his spirit so sweet. 
Moving among us and washing our feet Each new breath we're breathing now Seems to repeat Jesus is here right now Jesus is here and he's touching each mind Freeing us now from the thoughts that would bind Open your heart and I'm sure you will find Jesus is here right now As Jesus was leading his guys along, he veered off to the right as if to take a shortcut through a wheat field. But then they noticed he began to stop and take off kernels of wheat and roll them in his hand so as to shed the husk. And he began to treat himself to a nutrition break on about that time. And the guys began to follow suit. Thomas was thinking, I was wondering when we were going to get around to eating. <laughs> we were long overdue. I was starting to wonder if we ever would. But he begins to partake. And at one point, the Lord picks up a kernel of wheat and he kind of looks at it, examines it in the light of the sun. And James and John are there together and... Uh, John kind of nudges James and says, you know what, Jimmy, I think, uh, I think there's a parable coming on. I can see that look in his eyes, and I, I hope he explains it. There's a whole lot we just don't get, but I like what we do get. No, there's no other place to go. John responds and James says to John, says, Johnny, that, that look on Peter's face, it looks like he's getting ready to say something out of turn. Oh, Lord, help him to keep quiet. We love you, Pete. We love you, Pete. But just kind of keep this one to yourself. you got some good things to say, but some things that are kind of off the wall. And so they kind of begin to agree in intercessory fashion that Pete would be able to hold his peace. Jesus takes the kernel and he says, you know, fellas, except a kernel of wheat should fall to the ground and die, it abides alone. Death, in New Testament terms, is ceasing to exist in its original state. That's death by definition. But Jesus goes on and say, but if it falls to the ground and dies, it bears much fruit. In other words, as it falls, and it's encased in the ground, maybe a crevice, and the wind blows and covers it. That husk that served it so well in the atmosphere and protected it from the elements of the world is now a restriction of the life potential inside unless it dies, ceases to exist in its former state. And as that little husk surrounded seed is embedded in the ground and the wind blows across it and covers it. The chemicals in the ground begin to thin and perforate the shell. The moisture begins to invade the shell. It begins to swell and it starts to break and the roots desperately go down to derive the nutrition. And the shoots go up in anticipation of breaking through and seeing the sunlight and it begins to blossom and become fruitive with harvest potential that just started with a little kernel. The ability to leave a world-changing handprint in its vicinity. I'd like to add a parable, the story of Sam the Sea. Sam, he was a pretty regular, ordinary seed. He would get up every morning and he was still very much enjoying the security of his shell. It had served him well, that kind of street savvy and surviving and succeeding to a point. And it was a nice elliptical, very symmetrical kind of shell that could every now and then pick up a ray of sunlight and he could squeeze off around for the Lord and say something droll. And was rather pleased with himself and those around him felt Sam was a pretty cool seed. And he's getting up and looking at that 
attractiveness of his shell, but something begins to pulsate within of his life potential, the ability to procreate a harvest. And he's sensing the pulse and promise of it, and his shell is no longer looking very attractive. And he's thinking, I'm going to do something. So Sam goes out in the backyard and starts hurling himself against the brick wall of his house and he bounces off and hits the ground and just can't crack the shell. Some of the other shell and case seeds are looking from the top story and they're thinking, boy, Sam used to be at least semi-sane and somewhat cool, but I don't know what's gotten into him. I mean, he's just looking outrageous and Sam knows they're looking at him, but at this point, he doesn't care. He just wants the release of something real that is encased in this shell that he can't seem to break. So about the time he's bounced off the brick wall for the 30th time, and he's laying there exhausted and panting and just as hard shell than ever, he feels a shadow descending over him. It's a massive shadow. And he looks up and he sees Jesus. And Jesus reaches down with a nail-pierced hand and picks him up between his index finger and thumb and then puts him in his hand and says, you know, Sam, legally you're positioned in me, but I want you to submit to my spirit and let me place you in the selected soil of who I am with just the right people, just the right ministry, that that is customized for you as the school of the spirit, and just yield now as I kind of release you to the wind of the spirit into that crevice in the soil that covers that. And now begin to sense the moisture of the word of life seeping into you and swelling that shell. Begin to sense the thinning of it out just from the operation of the spirit. Oh, I know you're desperate. You're desperate with desire. Let your roots go down and derive the nutrition and your shoots Lift it up in worship and praise in the anticipation of breakthrough as your potential would become actual. And Sam, this would be true for you whether you were six months old in the Lord or 60 years old in the Lord and hadn't just quite gotten it. But now you're getting it. Now you're getting it. Now you're getting it. You're realizing your life potential. And to your fellow Sheldon K. Seeds, you look like you're just gone for good down for the count that you've been dead and buried and in a sense the only thing that's dead is going to be that shell it'll disintegrate there'll be vestiges of it that cling that you'll need to lay aside on a daily basis but progressively that shell gets reduced to fertilizer that you'll just dance in in victory and in the freedom of what had encased you in the carnality of self and now releasing the new self with all its life giving creative potential. So don't worry how they see you. Just know how I see you and I'm working in you and through you. Have you ever seen a tiny seed fall to the ground on a winter day, never to be found again? Covered there by the howl and wind blown dust of the earth. The little seed seems gone for good, yet goodness soon comes forth in the Father's plan. Sure as the planting comes the rain, sure as death there's life to gain, planted in the Savior's love, watered by the Spirit's rain from the Father up above. Life comes forth with the fruit of love and the seed of life to give that men might live. Come and dine at the table of the King. Taste the fruit of resurrection now and soon. Have you ever seen a broken life sink in a pit of dark despair, swirled in an aimless death-bound wind, pierced with the tearing shaft of fear, seem to pass from view? Seems every hope and every dream is gone, but it's not. Then comes the dawn. Oh, the shedding of the old self which has been declared legally dead, but now the Lord is administrating that as such. Out of 
the chains of death's decree to life comes forth and deeply breathes the fragrant scent of kingdom air and the king is standing there with a welcome kiss in the promised life in the marvelous joy of Jesus Christ the king to a blood-bought soul coming into its inheritance intimacy with God identity of sonship Authority and partnership, a hope and a future, a marvelous unfolding destiny, beginning in the now and unfolding and proceeding into eternity. April, a marvelous ability to look beyond people's shell. And it's sometimes the seeming disheveled gift wrap that they first come in, but seeing the gift they are, seeing their treasure potential. It's like the Lord just say, giving you a kind of discerning x-ray, to look into the depths of their heart, where they've been wounded, shattered, and torn apart. But you see, the healer they do seek, and into their lives you do speak. And they're awakened to the daylight of healing love, and see they can be made whole. They see his love more precious than gold through April. They see April love. I may have said that the last time. I won't sing that right now. <laughs> I actually used to sing it, and I met Pat Boone at a meeting that we had. This was clear back in 1971. He was had come into a reality of being filled with the Holy Spirit at that time in his life that had turned a major corner had a marvelous testimony, and he wrote a new book about his encounter with the Holy Spirit, baptism entitled, A New Song. It was a classic of its time. Now, Brother Rick, he is authentic. He's authenticity personified. When people look at Rick, what they see is what they get, and what they get is good, cause he's so close to the king. Getting closer to the king. Authentically real, and that's a good deal. And people that come here and assemble, Realize that you're not trying to resemble anybody else, but just to be who you are in Christ, increasingly becoming manifest, and Rick, it frees them to be authentic and to grow with you, to not come in here and being dense by their own pretense, but coming as they are, with the willingness to be transformed from their previous norm. So it's been and so it'll continue to be. Now, Brother Steve, who's back there in the technology center with the dashboard of the Star Trek in front of him, the Enterprise, and putting this thing on DVD. The willingness to be whatever you need to be in order to serve. And if it's something you don't know, you'll learn it. You're kind of God's handyman with a chest full of truth tools. And you'll take on a task when the Lord does ask and say, go for it, Steve. And you say, Lord, I believe I can do all things through Christ. And folks that need a pillar to lean on are drawn to you. you find that you stand strong on the rock that is so true. And they find a heart of encouragement 
It touches them at points to where they grieve. And in view of that need, along comes to you. Service with a smile. Your name, my brother? Uh, Your name? Richard. Richard. Richard Ableton, package of testimony in story form. Able to kind of sit back and exude the heat of a warm fireplace. You'll kind of pick up nuggets along the stream. Say, you know, I'm just going to add that one to my bag and share it at just the right time. The next thing you know, the Lord arranges for a time. Might be a one-liner, two-liner, or a three-liner. It's kind of a capsule. But the Lord gives you favor and they swallow it. And it becomes the energy of encouragement within. What's your name? Shauna? Sweetly created, a sense of decor, ministry of hospitality. It's domesticity with a dynamic. You're not just a flurry of a hurry of a Martha, but moves along in kind of a grace pace and comes with hospitality sweet with the living water of the word that washes folks' feet. You give me songs of the night till the morning light breaks in on me. The darkness gives way to the light of the day to promise that see. Meanwhile, with a smile in the dark, I hearken to your voice and rejoice at the sound of your song in the night. And rejoice at the sound of the sun in the night. Help me remember your name. Oh, Mary. Not only festive in your attire, which you always are whenever I see you, but with a festive spirit. It's a heart of joy that imparts its strength. And it's housed in the climate of your speech, the joy of the Lord. It's more than an emotion, although it's certainly that. But it's a very expression of his nature, the joy of the Lord that belongs to him. He imparts to you and through you. And in these days, it's a tremendous commodity to have in days when depression runs rampant. Anti-anxiety pharmaceuticals are having a heyday. Antidepressants. How folks need his hope and his joy, the absence of fear in the now and the here. Your words are so dear, but more importantly, your very soul causes the joy of the Lord to unfold. Rejoicing in the Lord is the kingdom key that unlocks the joy, and you've learned that well. You can't see Mary's wearing a very beautiful key necklace here. Jolena, renewed sensitivity and intuitivity in the spirit beyond what you ever knew before. It's 
It's more than just returning to your first love, but it's coming into a new love level for the Lord, an appreciation for His truth, and a delight in the Spirit and the freedom that He brings. It's where the Spirit of the Lord is His liberty. A prophetic intuitiveness that's been there before, but will be there in greater measure. It's a return for which long have yearned, and the Lord will maestro that into manifestation. And at times, as has been, but will be in greater frequency, a movement in prophetic evangelism, a sensing to where people are at in the marketplace, and having had a view of their heart, will intuitively, with targeted accuracy, speak to their need with prophetic grace. Times he'll ask you to ask some questions that he'll give you that'll open them up and begin to set the stage for doing what only he can do. But he'll do it in partnership with you. Jim Conversational evangelism. The ability to just relate, strike up with people a certain quiet and yet warm congeniality that engenders a trust. People sense they can trust you. And yet even a kind of boldness at times, it's not brazen, but it's straightforward. You're a pragmatic kind of guy. You see their need and you can look at life kind of like an engineer with a sense of cause and effect of just how the kingdom works. It's an operation. And the Lord's going to begin to give increasing revelation of just how that works and engender even a greater cooperation with that operation. As a man with truth tools that constructs and reconstructs lives in partnership with Jesus in the engineering of restoration. What's your name right here? Donna. Where there was in the past deep disappointment, the Lord came with his anger. Restored your hope. Oh, you're such a visionary and such a dreamer in a good kind of way. There'll be even a renewal of dreams and visions, more so than in past seasons in these days, Donna. At times you'll have a certain nudge and an unction that's not presumption, but a learning to step forth with faith that catches his currents and moves in harmony with him and sharing with others. You know what it is to experience the restoration of the Lord, which is still in progress. But you're fashioned as a nurse on the battlefield that would speak forth in healing love, the one who restores. Really help me remember your name. Michael. Patriarchal Father in the Lord, Michael. The ability to just put an arm around somebody's shoulder and speak words that are swift to uplift. Because you can do it, boy, you can do it, girl, because greater is he that's in you than he who's in the world. And you're able to translate that into prophetic porterhouse to the mature and to the young to state it as milk. More and more innovative, creative ways to relate. Right here, creative artistry. The ability to see in the spirit. Over here, a flair for the dramatic with a song in your heart, an ability to sing. 
And over here, capable of huge faith to believe what man would consider the impossible. But she'll say, I believe that God can move this mountain and it'll come to pass. What's your name? Susan. Sue? Susan. Susan. Coming into a new season of fruitful intercession, Susan, to where there's been an agony of soul to see family members made whole, to where the enemy had wrought his devastation, the Lord moving with restoration, meeting them where they're at in the midst of storm, to where their wrath is thrown fore and aft, but an ability to intercede where their hearts do bleed, and see the master walking upon the waves, even though they might be in prisons of their soul. The affliction of addiction, the king reveals himself for the ability to make them whole. And you're finding that it's so much more restful to intercede and pray for them than to try to fix them. That's hard work. I myself am a learning intercessor and a recovering controller. Hallelujah. <laughs> Somebody said for that. Going to close, kind of turn a corner this morning. God's in the business of restoration. Restoration is not the best of the good old days. We've got to get over that. Oh, there'll be vestiges that suggest past times because there's certain common denominator ingredients in renewals. Third great awakening, and in much of the world, is being engulfed with that third great awakening. Here we tend to be a little cerebral at the expense of our hearts. But the Lord's cutting through that. That's part of that seed that's disintegrating. The church is beginning to, much of it, at least the pockets we're in, come into its intercessory identity. Repenting from apathy, and with an urgency crying out to God to reveal his goodness that works repentance. And to bring a marvelous revival in our nation. He's restoring the church. He's taking the bride to himself. And in the embrace of his grace, learning to move with him in a certain cadence that's more like a dance than a march. Purging her of spot and wrinkle, spot, worldly blemishes. Wrinkle, religious rope that's done again and again. It will make us old before our time. I saw it many years ago as a woman seated on a chair and a stage. Her hands gnarled prematurely with age, protruding veins, nothing to show for her efforts. Every now and then would fidget to pull her dress, now soiled and torn, over her nameless. And then a figure coming from stage right, the bridegroom, walking with that kingly gait, coming up to her, stroking her cheek. Her face looks up, quivers into a smile, as if dare I hope for more. Then. He steps back and with two nail-pierced hands says, rise up and walk. And she thinks to herself, I've tried to talk this into myself I don't know how many times. I have tried to conjure up faith to respond to the promises of God, but now here I am with the promiser, a revelation in my heart, not just mental assent to a doctrine apart from its dynamic. And she's thinking to herself, Faith works by love, and I can sense faith coming forward. And I'm willing, even with fear and trembling and a shaky step, to step forward. To connect with the beginnings of his wholeness. And she steps forward, and it looks kind of like a spastic stagger, but she steps forward. And she collapses into his arms. 
When he steps down from the platform that they're on, the room's becoming illumined, and it's a ballroom. He begins to dance her about the floor, maneuvering her masterfully. Her feet are dragging, there's no strength in her ankles, but he begins to whisper his word in her ear. And she embraces it in her heart, in her depths, even desperately. And yet faith, it's coming by hearing the truth spoken in love. Strength begins to surge into her ankles and feet, and now she's moving with him, pretty much with his choreography, he starts to whirl her about. Periodically, she sees a serpent perched in the corner, poised as if to strike, and he begins to maneuver her in the direction of that. She says, that's what I feared most. He says, I know, but just yield to me, fear not. And together, they dance in perfect sync on the spine of the serpent that shrieks and cries and lays limp in defeat executing the judgment of the cross upon it. And this scenario is repeated several times as he is moving her now skillfully in the direction of a banqueting table set with angels ascending and descending. Years ago, I set the vision to music. It goes like this. She's laid aside her pride and her passion. They've taken their toll and they've left her They've torn and soiled her garments once lovely. She pulls them to cover her lame tight feet. She sighs for the one she remembers so tender, reflecting on times of pure delight. When life was made sweet by his rule and his carry, she loves to return to his arms from the night. She says, come and dance with me, oh my brother, now that you've forsaken your other lovers. Hold your arms open wide, I'll fill them with myself. Let my love song ring in your heart, girl, I'm whirling it toward our banqueting table. Taking my golden vessels down the She takes his hand and she rises so slowly. Power returns to her ankles and feet. She glides in his arms as they tread upon serpents who shrivel and cry in the crush of defeat. Their hearts beat as one with a rhythm so constant. Moving in melody, richly released, an escort of angels ascending and rising follows them to join them. At the feast, she's so glad she responded when she heard him say, Come and dance with me, oh my bride, now that you've forsaken your other lovers. Hold your arms open wide, I'll fill them with myself. Let my love song ring in your heart, hey, I'm whirling your toy, my banqueting table, taking my golden vessels down from the shelf to receive my. Sail on silver girl, sail on high. Your time has come to shine. Your dreams will come away. See how they shine. When in need of friends, I'm sailing just behind. i
Shake you for such a time as this to be poured into by me. And all you have to yield to me is I would turn you seemingly. Your flesh thinks you're being turned upside down, but your spirit knows you're being tipped to pour out the deposit that I've placed within you. And the glory of the Lord shall be with you. And all flesh shall see it together. And the glory of the Lord shall be with you. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken to you. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken to you. And did everyone get a word here except Donna? And she and I prophesy to one another conversationally regularly. We're a small operation. Dick Williams Ministries, I'm the president and janitor. She's the bookkeeping brains and the one with the social skills that can visit with more than two people at a time without ADD setting. I'm very comfortable in front of a crowd, small, medium, or large. a bit socially challenged in any kind of gathering that might be a little on more than two or three. <laughs> ah, but this thing works that we do. I know the bookkeeper has had called the janitor in at time for a corrective interview due to the messy state of his office. I'm a visionary, she's a detailed person. Between the two of us, we're one responsible adult. Hey, but after 47 years plus, it's, it's working. God's working on us, in us, through us. Whatever you've received personally this morning, whether you were being addressed, eyeball to eyeball, or maybe something that was spoken over somebody else, a dynamic ditto jumped across the room and said, you too, and help yourself to a slice of their prophetic pie. Or whether just in the course of just a general scope of teaching and storytelling and song singing, the Lord imparted a live cold and put it on deposit and underscored it as something just as personalized as a prophetic word to me. God be glorified with that, even as he refines and develops that deposit and brings it into demonstration, exceeding the abundant beyond all we could ask or think. And to him be the glory. Amen. Pastor Rick. covered a lot of things that we've been talking about and the idea of 
revival and what God's doing in the body and to the bride. And so I hope you take that with you and continue to join us as we go through that journey. And uh, I can tell you this, those that received the word last time Dick was here, I've seen tremendous growth in each and every one of them. And I continue to see growth in this body uh, because of guests like Dick and because of the hunger that this ministry has for the presence of God and for his revival throughout the, throughout the treasure valley. Because I think we're all here firm believers that God is bringing revival to the treasure valley in many different places and in many different ways. We just want to be part of it. And so we'll continue next week um, discussing the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which uh, we heard in receiving the forgiveness and the restoration and even the journey of sanctification. Now we need to complete that cycle for revival to go into the depths of what the Holy Spirit has for us. So please join us and continue that journey with us. Uh, thank you all for coming. And unless anybody else has anything, uh, I think we're finished today. Anybody have anything else they'd like to burn? Well, having said that, um, Heavenly Father. Oh, wait a minute. i got to share this. I'm sorry. <laughs> Not sorry, but um, April and I experienced a, a miracle slash uh, answer to prayer yesterday. Um, we had gotten a message that a, a dear friend of ours had slipped into a coma the night before. And um, it's due to the practice of medicine. But see, God's not in the business of practicing. He knows what he's doing. And uh, so I got up that yesterday morning and I said my prayers for this gentleman and, and uh, he hasn't been awake for almost three weeks. Now the coma was something new. They took him to rehab. They med medicated him and boom, he went down. And they took him to the ER that night and we saw him the, the next morning. And all I asked God for was two simple things, is that he would be awake and alert to know that we were there to be with him. And secondly, that through his experience, he would come out with a hunger to live to see why God kept him around. We walked into that room yesterday afternoon. He was awake. He was awake for the first time in many, many days. And I said to him, I said, why do you think you're awake? Why do you think you're still here? He said, Rick, I have gone through the torment of the enemy attacking me and attacking me and attacking me, trying to steal my life for the last two weeks. And he said, all of a sudden it was done this morning. And the Lord showed me that he has a plan and a purpose in my life. And so then I went on to tell him what we, we had prayed. April and I prayed as she got up too. And what we had prayed over his life and what, what we were asking the Lord to do. And he just started weeping in tears. And it was a simple prayer, everyone. It was a simple request. And I just... I, I was going to save it for next week, but for some reason you needed to hear it this week. You needed to hear that no matter how simple your prayer is, God is listening. Because I got nothing special. I just put a request before God. That's where the specialness lies. 
because he's the specialist. The doctors, they're still practicing. But Jesus has it down. Jesus can put his hand on there. And, and this man's wife is a close friend of ours. We've known her a lot longer. And she just was so grateful. She said, she said, you don't realize how out of it he's been. I am so grateful that you're here. And then she goes on to say, because the presence of God was here today. And so I want you to know, sometimes you go, well, where is he? And if you didn't feel it today, you got to keep looking. And if you don't feel it on a regular basis when you when you get up to the time you go to bed, then you're not knocking on that door. Because he's right there. He's ready. He's waiting. And he's not always behind the door. Sometimes he's right beside you or sometimes he's behind you to catch it. But he's always right here in your heart, in the presence of the Holy Spirit. And so as you leave here today, take the words that you were given. And first and foremost, know that God had a real gift for you today because Dick doesn't always give everyone a word. But when he comes here, God keeps working him through everyone. And some of you would say it's because we're small. And I would tell you because God's got a message for you. And he wants you to hear it. So take it and listen and work with it. And if you need a copy, that's part of the reason Steve re records these things. And we'll release it. So come each moment of your life, whether you do it here or you do it somewhere else, and spend time because just as Dick sang to you today, Jesus is singing to you every moment of your life how much he loves you and he cares for you. Amen. And how much he believes that you're everything that you were created to be. And let the world be what the world is. And let God do in you what God plans in doing. So Father, we just thank you today that you are an awesome God. And, and Father, that, that your power goes beyond our understanding. Your love sometimes is even more than what we feel that we can receive. Our worthiness has never come close to what you've given us. But everything that Jesus died that we would receive. And so, Father, we stand before you made righteous by your Son. And we say thank you. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your glory. And thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit. We receive you. We glorify you. And we exhort you with all that we could muster within ourselves in our imperfected state letting you work through us so things would change around us and that your light and your glory would shine through this world. And we just thank you, Father God, for all that you're doing with us, around us, and that we too are being used to touch other lives and be the glory of God. And as each one leaves today, Lord, I ask for your heavenly protection over them. Guard them and keep them safe. Bring them closer to you every day, every moment. And show them, show them your love and show them your glory. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Amen. All right, everybody, thank you.